Classical conditioning can be so powerful, in fact, that it can actually make us sick by suppressing the body's immune system. The immune system is a complex network of specialized organs and cells that protect the body from disease. It releases antibodies to destroy or contain dangerous bacteria, viruses, and other invaders. When the immune system is conditioned not to work, the results can be devastating. At the University of Rochester Medical School, researcher Robert Ada and his colleague Nicholas Cohn condition rats to dislike something they usually like very much, the taste of saccharin-flavored water. Ader discovered he had also unintentionally conditioned the rat's immune system to shut down. We were pairing a saccharin-flavored drinking solution with an agent that produced a temporary stomach ache in rats uh, using a drug called cyclophosphamide. And indeed, we found, as we expected, that uh, the more of the saccharin they consumed, the stronger was the aversion to the taste of saccharin uh, when it was paired with this drug that made them sick. Over a month's time, giving these animals repeated exposures to saccharin instead of their usual water, some of the animals died. Now, this was an experiment in which animals should not have died. There was no reason for them to have died. And when this happens in an experiment, when it's not supposed to, this is troublesome. You, you look for a reason why. It turns out that the drug we were using to induce this taste aversion is a powerful immunosuppressive drug. It suppresses immune responses. At the same time that we were conditioning the behavioral response, which was avoidance of the saccharin, we were also conditioning the effects of the drug that is an immunosuppressive response. Every time the animal was exposed to saccharin, there was an aversion response, and there was also a suppression of the immune system. So even the immune system may be influenced by conditioning. We can learn to become sick and possibly die. Classical conditioning is not the only kind of conditioning. While Pavlov had shown the importance of learning relationships between two stimulus events, an American psychologist named Edward Thorndike pioneered the study of another kind of learning around the turn of the century. Thorndike was interested in how individuals learn solutions to the complex puzzles the world devises. How do we and other animals learn the habits and new skills that enable us to find our way through life's mazes? By carefully observing, measuring, and quantifying the performance of experimental animals, Thorndike discovered the type of learning we call instrumental conditioning. Thorndike's animals work by trial and error. The actions that brought reward, that is, the actions that were instrumental to achieving a goal, became learned. To Thorndike, it's the consequences of what an individual does that most influence the learning process. Thorndike's Law of Effect states that learning is controlled by its consequences. Those behaviors followed by good consequences are selected and repeated, while those leading to bad consequences, or no consequences at all, are not repeated. Another American psychologist who was greatly influenced by Pavlov was John B. Watson. Watson believed that learned, observable behavior was the only thing in psychology worthy of scientific study. He attacked the doctrines of inherited traits and instincts as the cause of behavior. Instead, he spoke of the unlimited power of conditioning and environmental control to mold the behavior of animals and humans alike. To study the power of conditioning, Watson used infants as subjects, as you can see in this original footage from the 1920s. Watson showed that strong emotions could be learned in one situation by conditioning and then generalized, that is, transferred to other similar situations without having to repeat the original conditioning. Watson and his assistant, Rosalie Rayner, conditioned the infants to fear a white rat they had liked at first. 
In this case, they work with an eight-month-old called Little Albert. Each time the rat was presented, a loud gong was struck, startling the infant. Soon the appearance of the rat alone was enough to make him cry and become fearful. This was classical conditioning at work. When the child crawled away from the rat towards safety, her behavior was rewarded in that her fear was reduced. Instrumental conditioning was now at work. Later, when the children saw any stimulus that was similar to the rat, a rabbit, a dog, a fur coat, a mask, their learned fear was generalized to all of them. The once fearless children were now easily frightened by a host of harmless things. Watson's pioneering study was controversial because of the way he used children. Such an experiment could not be conducted today because of strict ethical guidelines governing the treatment of all research subjects, humans and animals. A few years after the demonstrations, an associate of Watson, Mary Cover Jones, developed techniques for removing naturally conditioned fears in youngsters. Jones was the first behavior therapist. But these techniques came too late for some of Watson's subjects. Little Albert's fate remains unknown. Another towering figure in the study of learning was Harvard psychologist B.F. Skinner. Skinner built upon the ideas of Pavlov, Thorndike, and Watson, and was interested in how behavior is influenced by external events in our lives. For many psychologists, behavior is explained as an effect of internal processes, either mental or neural. For them, behavior is seen as the outward expression of what's going on inside. But Skinner disagrees. His research investigates behavior in terms of its relationship to environmental variables that precede and follow it. You can think of it as psychology's ABCs, antecedents, behavior, consequences. In the early 1940s, Skinner began to examine a simple response of an ordinary animal. A pigeon pecking a disc that was followed by a reinforcer, say a food pellet or some water. A reinforcer is anything that increases the rate of responding. The pigeon was kept in a highly controlled environment that's come to be known as a Skinner box. And Skinner's version of instrumental conditioning is known as operant conditioning. Well, operant behavior is behavior which operates upon the environment and produces consequences. And operant conditioning is the change that takes place when those consequences have a particular effect. And we call the effect strengthening or reinforcing. Through operant conditioning, pigeons have been trained to peck at the correct sum of numbers and to perform all kinds of feats. Operant conditioning is one important aspect of learned behavior. But in Skinner's view of psychology, all learned behavior can be stripped down to the relationships between the behavior, its antecedents, and its consequences. He believes that any behavior that is followed by a consequence will change in its rate of occurrence in direct relationship to changes in the consequence. Today, psychologists are pushing the limits of operant conditioning beyond the Skinnerian model. Behavioral psychologist Howard Racklin at the State University of New York looks at ways to enable self-control by using operant conditioning methods. Self-control, like everything else, is a little bit of environment and a little bit of genes, like everything. Self-control is really choosing between a large but delayed reward and a smaller but more immediate reward. A larger reward is more abstract and difficult to put your finger on, like good health. Things like good health or even job satisfaction are often the result of long-term behavior in which delayed gratification was consciously chosen. Okay. Racklin looks at how...